Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Strangers in Jerusalem YouTube channel and podcast, where we explore the Gospels and the Jesus traditions within their Jewish context. A lot of my students have questions about, you know, Jesus commanded baptism, but did Jews baptize? And what was John the Baptist doing? Why were people coming in? Why would Jesus go to him at that time, at that moment? So a lot of this is to clear that up, to make more sense of it before moving on to the actual accounts of Jesus' baptism in the Gospels. So follow me. Let's go to Jerusalem. So now the question is, if the crowds came to John specifically for immersion, would it have been to join some new movement or to engage in a ritual for purity following repentance? It's probably the latter. It's not to join a new movement, but it's to engage in a ritual. And this is confirmed by Josephus. So here's what Josephus says in his book Antiquities. John, John the Immerser, John the Baptist, was a good man and had exhorted the Jews to lead righteous lives, to practice justice towards their fellows and piety towards God. And so doing to join in baptism. In this view, this was a necessary preliminary for baptism, was to be acceptable to God. They must not employ it to gain pardon for whatever sins they had committed, but as a consecration of the body, implying that the soul was already thoroughly cleansed by the right by right behavior. So we, were, we talked about this a little bit before, where this is what the, the Qumran community, the people the, in, near the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea sect, this is what they were saying also. You repent, and then you come to John to, be, to engage in a uh, purity ritual. That's sort of the last step in, in, in purity or repentance. Okay, so how do we understand these activities in relation to baptism today? In the modern times, today, most Christians perform one-time immersions as uh, an initiation into a new group. So you're initiated into the body of Christ when you're, you're performing your baptism, a one-time event. This is an outward performance of a new birth and inclusion into the body of Christ. This is called proselyte baptism. Proselyte baptism, as we understand it today, was not customary among Jews in Jesus' day. There is no evidence that Jews in the early first century required people to submit to a once and for all immersion. No such practice is mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the writings of Philo, our first century Jewish philosopher. The writings of Josephus contain none of this, nor the earliest rabbinic literature. None of that body of literature suggests that people would, even Gentiles coming into the Jewish movement, would submit to a once and for all convert baptism. As for John's immersion, it seems that most scholars conclude that he did conf confer baptism on individuals only once. That's a, it seems like a lot of Christian scholars just sort of imply that in the commentaries. But note that neither the Gospels nor Josephus makes this claim in relation to John. Jews who came to John the Baptist, including Jesus, were not seeking to join a new Jewish movement by undergoing a one-time immersion. For, for, for early Jews, first century Jews, immersion was performed periodically. This is, this is a frequent ritual. It seemed to be connected to both purity and repentance, as we've already discussed. The Hebrew Bible codified injunctions for a priest to immerse himself in water after becoming ritually pure. This is sort of the origin of this practice that then later developed. So it, were the, it was the priests that would immerse themselves. They wouldn't have somebody else do it. They would do it themselves after becoming ritually impure. Later prophets used the water cleansing imagery in association with repentance and the renewal of Israel. So now we have a, a scenario, or um, I guess evidence in the Hebrew Bible, where priests immerse themselves, and now the prophets using water cleansing imagery in relation to all of Israel. And then when you get even closer to, the, to Jesus' day, in the second century BC, or BCE, immersion rituals expanded to include not just priests, but perhaps a large segment of the population. Lots and lots of people were now going to these immersion pools, called mikvah, or mikvahot in the plural, to purify themselves. In the archaeological record, in the few generations preceding Jesus, we see that these use of full-body tubs, or a mikvah, exploded all over Judea and Galilee. Archaeologists have found remains of these tubs at the temple, at the ruins of synagogues. They found them in big cities and, and also in small towns, in both wealthy and poor homes all over the place. In addition to all that, there are there's accounts of several different desert washers, as we're calling them. There's John the Baptist as a, as a desert washer. He goes out in the wilderness to perform these immersions, but there's others. Josephus' teacher, Banus, was also one who, who baptized frequently for purification. There's also the Essenes. This, the, uh, the Essene group also immersed themselves frequently because of purity. The priestly sect at Qumran, near the Dead Sea, whether these were Essenes or some sort of break-off Sadducean group, they also practiced similar rituals and 
the activities of John the Baptist kind of fit this pattern. So what this tells us is that John the Baptist was not, his activities, his ritual was not new or revolutionary, but it fit within the first century Jewish setting. One possible rationale for this expansion of immersion rituals in the first and second centuries BC is that God's spirit, Jews understood that God's spirit is poured out upon his people if they are pure. And they're poured out upon all of Israel. This is in Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. Now the way to purity, if they take the earlier Israelite ideal, the way to purity is through the cleansing of the soul by repentance that culminates in a purity immersion. A few notable first century Jews outside, well, first and second century Jews outside of the New Testament, so namely Rabbi Akiva and Josephus, also associated immersion with repentance. Ideally, for, for many first century Jews, the process of repentance included both an inward change of heart and an outward manifestation of immersion. When Jews approached John to be immersed, they did so as an act of repentance, it says in Acts 19, 3 through 4. John's message of repentance fit with the expanded phenomenon of immersion during this period. John's concern, however, as revealed in his Viper sermon in Matthew 3 and Luke 3, was that too many people were relying on immersion rituals without having a broken and contrite heart. That's the language we find in Psalm 51, Psalm 34, Isaiah 57. These, some of these places we, we find it over and over in Jewish literature where the writings suggest that a person who's repenting has to have a contrite heart. For centuries, Christians have portrayed Judaism and Jews as a, a highly legalistic, religion that's just focused on a bunch of, of deeds and they were you know devoid of the heart and compassion and repentance and that's just not the case the ideal in ancient judaism is is, is the same today among christians to do things for the right reason to have an inward motive love of god love of fellow man you know uh, this sort of thing a contrite heart so for for john the baptist it seemed that some had missed the point and this is often the case with any group of people who performs a ritual frequently they perform the ritual it becomes a, it becomes a habit becomes habitual, and you, you always run the risk of just going through the motions and not letting it sink in, into your soul. So that's what John the Baptist is talking about. Similar to John, the Dead Sea sect at Qumran condemned a reliance on immersion without a repentant heart. Here's a passage I'll, I'll put up on the screen. This is from a text that is written by the Dead Sea community, the Dead Sea Scroll uh, community. This is written for all the members of the community regarding repentance. So note, note the similarities with John's overall focus on repentance. Quote, ceremonies of atonement cannot restore his innocence neither cultic waters his purity. He cannot be sanctified by baptism in oceans and rivers, nor purified by mere ritual bathing. Through an upright and humble attitude, his sin may be covered, and by humbling himself before all God's laws, his flesh can be made clean. Only thus can he really receive the purifying, the purifying waters and be purged by the cleansing flow. To be sure, the immersion ritual does not seem to be tied exclusively to the act of repentance, or even primarily to the act of repentance, but more so to purity which at times requires repentance prior to the purity immersion. So in other words, a penitent state must be achieved before performing the, the purity ritual immersion, according to, to many of these quotes that we've seen. But thanks for watching. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the, the YouTube channel and also uh, check out the other, the, the other videos and my recently published book called A Stranger in Jerusalem, Seeing Jesus as a Jew. You'll get many details in there on this topic and other related topics.